Hello, everybody. So, pornography. <laughs> Just after lunch, good topic, I hope. So, um, the task I was given for today was to let you know as much as I possibly can about the topic of sex and porn addiction and, critically, to ensure you've got some really usable tools and skills that you can take back to you back with you, and I've got 60 minutes to do that, so that's, that's a bit of a tall order. So the first thing I want to say is that if this seems a little bit superficial and a little bit like I'm just kind of skimming over the surface of some of this, it's because I am, okay? I am. It goes a heck of a lot deeper than this, and there's, we, we also, we're a training organization and we um, deliver diploma training to therapists. This is a huge topic. This is a whole diploma, yeah? You're getting an hour but I want to make it as useful and as relevant as possible. So I'm just you know, praying that God's going to fill in the gaps in all the stuff that I can't do. Having said that, you can buy the book, Confronting Porn, that I wrote specifically for Christians um, struggling with this. So that, yeah, there is obviously a lot more in that. Um, right, who do I say next to? So that the, uh, that'll be somebody over there. Great. Um, so let me just say... <laughs> A, a little bit where I'm from, so yeah, my, uh, my name's Paula Hall, you know that. I've been a therapist for about 28 years now, um, working primarily in sex and relationship issues, and it was about 10 years ago that I started specialising in sex and porn addiction. Um, 10 years ago, it was just me. Uh, six years ago, there was me and Nick, me mate Nick. Um, now, there's 19 of us um, around oh, uh, about 12 different places around the UK. This is booming. This is an epidemic that it is growing so fast. So uh, at the Laurel Centre, so, we, so we've got centres all around the UK, we offer individual therapy, couple counselling. Um, we also do sex therapy, we do intensive recovery groups. We also do very specific faith groups as well. So we do intensive recovery courses for um, Christian leaders and, uh, and Christians. Um, basically, the recovery programme is exactly the same as the other, as the heathen one, as we sometimes call it. Um, but... <laughs> But it's delivered by Christians, and it's in an open environment where we can talk about God, talk about being created in the image of God, and obviously get you know prayer and um, you know reading the Bible and all that stuff into the recovery program as well. Um, yeah, okay, that'll do on that one. Let's get to the the main event. Maybe I could just. So, porn stats. It is a $97 billion industry. Am I going to have to do that every time? How are we going to do this? I'm used to, I'm used to having one of those, you know. Um, 50 to 75% of men and women worldwide view online porn. Search engines deal with 80 million requests daily for porn. And this next one, 25% of all search terms are for pornography. Yeah, so average search engine, one in four of what is ever typed in that bar is for pornography of some type. Uh, brilliant resource um, website, Your Brain on Porn. It is excellent for um, resources, for all sorts of stuff. Really, really good website. They get 20,000 unique visitors a day. So, why? So that's a bit of the scale of the problem. As I say, it is getting bigger and bigger all the time. Why do people look at pornography? Now, I'm not suggesting these are the right reasons. I'm saying these are some of the reasons that people say. Um, education. Unfortunately, and I don't know what your experiences are in the environments where you work, but our sex and relationship education within schools is still pretty pants, isn't it? It's still pretty rubbish. Um, and I think, no doubt, one of the key reasons that young people particularly look at pornography is because they think they're going to get some education there. They're going to find out how you do it, what it's all about. They actually, that's, that's why they go. Exploration. For many people, it may be about exploring their sexuality, exploring their gender. Um, I'm not assuming that all of you, by the way, are only working with nice, cosy church Christians, who've young people who, of course, don't have genitals until they get married. So, uh, <laughs> so none of this stuff you ever have to worry about. Um, I'm assuming you're working across all sorts of different types of environments. So I'm 
things from a general perspective. Um, so for many, it's about exploration, um, and certainly for a lot of couples, look at pornography, might be about getting some new tips and techniques, something different to do. Um, entertainment, one of the things that many young people get very annoyed about, which lots of adults, um, I'm not quite sure where I class myself, but anyway, um, like to say is, well, the thing with pornography, of course, is it's not real. It's not real. It's not like real life. Most people who've watched porn are like, yeah. Next minute, you're going to be telling me that EastEnders isn't real. Of course it's not real. It is entertainment, and most people know that. So telling somebody well, you need to realize it's not like real life is, yeah, like saying... Casualty is not like real life. We kn they know that. They know that it's entertainment. It is edited highlights. That's what it is. It's cut to the chase, cut to the good bit. That's what it's about. It's about entertainment. Um, and, of course, excitement, which is the obvious one. So the power of porn. Why? Oh, why, oh, why is it so powerful? Um, somebody said some years ago that... Um, it was the Senate, it was in the American Senate somewhere, that pornography was like the crack cocaine of drugs. So to drug addiction, porn is like the crack cocaine. It is incredibly addictive. And I think one of the reasons for that is because it is part of our survival drive. God created us to repopulate the planet through sex. He could have created any number of different ways of doing it that would have been considerably less enjoyable, but you know, in his infinite wisdom, he chose sex as the way that we would repopulate the planet. So it's part of our survival. To want sex is like need wanting to eat. Unlike food, you don't die without sex. I know some of you think you will. <laughs> Certainly addicts think they will, but you will not die if you don't have sex, but you will die if you don't have food. But in terms of a species, we will die out if we don't have sex. So sex is part of our survival drive. The other thing is this great gift that God has given us. The only species that has it is erotic empathy. So we as human beings get turned on by our partner being turned on. We get aroused by seeing somebody else, our partner being aroused, which is a wonderful and amazing thing. And that's why humans tend to have sex in private because if anyone else is around, they're going to get off on it and it's going to be a bit weird. But you don't, you don't get any other animal, cows, sheep, dogs, don't go and find a nice little quiet corner where nobody else can watch what they're doing. Yeah? We're the only species that does this and that is because we have this amazing gift of erotic empathy, which is, I, I really do think is, is something amazing from God. The other thing I want to say in terms of this survival drive, I I, the other thing I think sex is so powerful is I think, well, I know it's God's creation, but I also think God created us ultimately to crave intimacy and ecstasy. We crave ecstasy. We crave intimacy. And ultimately, I believe that is what he puts in us to search for him and to long for heaven. Yeah, this side, we're never really going to have that level of intimacy and ecstasy that we're going to get in heaven. But, you know, we, we ain't there yet. That's our ultimate goal. And that is what we crave, intimacy and ecstasy. And I think the closest we can get to that, this side, is within our human relationships. And unfortunately, also within pornography and sex addiction. So in some respects, I think this is actually meeting an innate drive and desire that God has put in us, which obviously has gone horribly, horribly awry. But I think that is why the craving is so strong, because it's actually a way of seeking intimacy and ecstasy. So <laughs> we're one step behind, slow down. Um, AAA engine, the other reason that it's so powerful, th this, of course has been, the smartphone has been the absolute game changer in terms of pornography. Um, the AAA engine is, the three A stand for accessibility, anonymity, and affordability. I went to a really interesting conference some years ago, and... Um, which was with, with porn producers. I'm mixing all sorts of worlds now. It's churches, great porn producers, and it's fascinating. But... Um, <laughs> 
I got, got into this really in-depth sort of de conversation with a guy who was absolutely furious at the state of the porn industry now. Because so much is free, that means, and he kind of got a point, that, that because it's free, so many young people can access it. And he was talking about the good old days of porn, when you had to pay for it, you had to be 18, you had to have your own credit card or steal somebody's, but you had to have a credit card, you had to pay for pornography. Now it's free. Clearly he lost a huge amount of money, which is why he was mostly annoyed about it, I suspect. But um, it's now totally affordable because it's free, totally accessible and completely anonymous. Um, I, I was um, in, in my church small group this week and um, one of the, the guys in my group is a professor and he was moaning about the number of his students who were sat there on, his, on their phones. And I said, well, how do you know that they're not just using it for notes? I don't, I'm sure some of you have got devices in front of you using for notes. And, uh, and he said, oh, I never thought about that. And I, I said, I have a really good way of getting around that because if there's anybody in my audiences with their phone out, I can very easily go... Um, we know what you might be doing there. Boy, do people close it down quickly. Like, There's notes. I'm taking notes. Um, but you could. You could be saying, in fact, there was, um, I think it was something I just read on Twitter. I mean, literally in the last couple of hours, somebody complaining about the number of people on the tube on the London Underground on their phones who are really quite overtly looking at porn or are on Grindr on one of the adult hookup apps. It's, it's just so easy. Um, yeah, the final one is supernormal stimuli. Now, I'm going to explain that a bit more. Supernormal stimuli is the name we give to any stimuli that is much, much greater than was originally evolutionarily needed. That's not a word, is it? Um, <laughs> Um, much, much greater than was actually originally intended. So, uh, next slide will give a good example. So, um, we, many of you will know this. We have an innate desire and craving for things that are sweet, yeah, and things that are fatty. Now, the thinking is that many years ago, hunter-gatherer days, we needed sweet and fatty things in order to survive. Now, back in those days, there wasn't very much of it around, and we didn't have fridges, okay? So if you came across a few sweet berries or a nice bit of fat, not quite sure what you'd find, but you couldn't take it home and put it in the fridge. So you had a binge mechanism. So all of us have, within our limbic system, a binge mechanism, okay? Now, apparently, research has been done that has demonstrated that the ring donut is the perfect balance of sugar and fat, and that is why they're so attractive to us. Now, unfortunately, some of us can still approach a plate of ring donuts with the binge mechanism. There is still that voice saying, this could be the last chance I ever get <laughs> to eat a ring donut. This is the cause of obesity, because we think it's the last chance we're ever going to have to enjoy that. And we have to rely on our neocortex, our thinking brain, to send a message to our limbic system going, you can have one another day, you don't have to have it now, and do all that stuff. And that is how we manage our diet. So we also have, the thinking is that if you see someone really attractive, you can have a sudden surge of dopamine, and dopamine is the chemical that's the common denominator in all addictions. We get a sudden surge of dopamine, which gives us sexual arousal and a desire to have sex with that person. We should mate, we should have a child. You're beautiful, you're wonderful, have babies. And, and, and that is a limbic system response that's very kind of natural around wanting to repopulate the planet. And we have to rely on our neocortex to go, uh, you're, you're married, it's, you know. The, the cousin thing earlier was interesting. That, that, in theory, is an automatic thing that cuts it out, but not necessarily. Um, <laughs> I'm not going there, it's a different talk. Um, <laughs> um, no, where was I? So, yeah, we rely on our neocortex to tell our thinking brain that actually, no, whilst I find this person very attractive and I would quite like to make babies with them, I'm not going to. I'm going to think purer thoughts. I'm not going to go there and, and, and we put it back. Internet pornography gives you endless, endless 
supply of that, of that super normal stimuli. So we're designed to be attracted to attractive others. Pornography gives you an endless supply of attractive others with no, say, no boundaries that you're crossing. And there's an argument that actually looking at porn doesn't hurt anybody. That's, I'm going to try and keep on the health side rather than the moral side in this debate because that's a whole other one. Um, but it's, <laughs> it is a bit like watching cookery programs and not actually eating. Yeah? You're not actually going to put on any weight. You're not actually going to do any harm if you're just watching The Great British Bake Off. It's not the same as devouring the place of donuts. And pornography, you could argue, is a similar kind of process. Yeah? Does that make sense? Kind of in, ter in terms of the, sort of the, the, the natural mechanics, if you keep the moral bit out of it. Okay, so what about the perils of porn? Well, unrealistic expectations, because it is the edited highlights only. Um, it, it, it means f for so many people, there is the, the, it creates you know, um, real fears about body image, about performance. Uh, next one, which is slightly similar. The single sexual perspective, it's only ever brilliant. And those of you in, in relationships, um, making an assumption here, but <laughs> sex ain't always great. Sometimes, frankly, you really do wish you'd had a cup of tea and watched Coronation Street. <laughs> <laughs> You don't say it, okay? <laughs> That's lovely. You never say it. But sometimes, yeah, you know, sometimes it's amazing, it's brilliant, it's fantastic, sometimes it's all right, and sometimes you wish you hadn't bothered, and that's just, just the way it is. Um, but porn is always fantastic, yeah? In porn, you don't ever get somebody checking their watch or counting the cracks and scenes or whatever. Um, it's only ever brilliant. So again, that sets up that false expectation. Uh, misogyny. I have been, I could, oh, yeah, if I had a pound for every time I've been asked to go on a feminist anti-porn rally, I would be very wealthy. Um, I, I, there is certainly a feminist perspective in terms of the impact that it has on women. There's no doubt about that, so please don't hear me wrong. I'm not dismissing that, but this also has a massive impact on male sexuality as well and the way that men view sex and sexuality and their sexual performance and what they should do and how they should perform. Yes, it may affect how they view women, but it also affects how they view themselves. And for women, I think a whole generation of women are growing up expecting their partner to know exactly what to do and how to do it and how to make it fantastic. Yeah, because sex is never boring or painful, generally, in porn. So these expectations, I think, are huge on men and women, and particularly, obviously, on the next generation. And addiction, which... Have I got two 17 minutes? I've done 17 minutes, right. Um, which is what we're going to focus this on. Now, not everybody who watches pornography becomes addicted. I hope that's kind of pointing out the obvious, but it, you know, it does need to be said. Not everybody who drinks alcohol is an alcoholic. Now, if you have very, very, very strong views against alcohol, if within your faith tradition you believe that alcohol is a sin and is wrong and you should not drink alcohol, but you have a glass of wine once a week on a Saturday night, you may have broken your moral value system, but that doesn't make you an alcoholic, okay? So, if you are a Christian who views pornography once or twice a fortnight, month, whatever, for 10 minutes at a time, that doesn't make you an addict. Now, I'm not saying it's not a problem and you shouldn't look at it, particularly when it's going against your values and it's not what you want to be doing, but it doesn't actually make you an addict. And I do think sometimes it's not helpful to assume that every person that says they're viewing pornography and has a problem with it must be an addict, because that's not necessarily the case, particularly if they're Christian. Um, but also it's not helpful to assume that everybody who looks at pornography will become addicted, or everybody that drinks alcohol will. And I think also in the same way with, with, with alcohol, there may be periods in your life when you drink too much. Um, drinking alcohol is what happens in adolescence, it's part of I know, whatever, write a passage, I don't know. Um, but it happens, and there's going to be certain periods of adolescent life and perhaps adult life when you binge on alcohol. It still doesn't necessarily make you an alcoholic. And this is not saying it's, it makes it okay, but it's a different kind of problem. And I think it is important to recognize those differences. 
So, uh, prevalence, growing, I've, I've kind of said this, right, yeah, next. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, that was a good one. 27,000 people Google sex addiction or porn addiction every day. Wow, yeah. Next. This was scary. A tenth of 12 to 13, tenth of 12 to 13 year olds fear they're addicted to porn. And this was the latest one, 10% of men and 7% of women in the United States say that they are addicted to porn. Um, I have uh, this free online resource called pornaddictionhelp.co.uk. It's, it's a completely free, downloadable resource. Um, if you want to get a copy of it, because there, it's completely free, of course, there's a catch. <laughs> um, the, the catch is that I ask people to, completely anonymously to answer 10 questions before they can access the resource, which just allows me to build a pattern of how many people of what age are downloading it, it's where these stats come from, from that. If you would like a copy of this, because you would like to use the resource with somebody, there is a little box that says for professionals. If you put your name and email address in that, we'll send you a, a, a PDF copy of it for your records, and you'll know what it is if you're talking to somebody else about it, okay? But please don't, if you, you'll have to lie, basically, to go through the 10 questions, how long do you think you've had the problem? Please don't do that, because you just muck up the stats. Um, so, so one of the questions is, how old have you? So the last time I checked this, so this has been used by about 25,000 people now. Uh, 4,366 were under 25. 17% were female, 435 of those were 16 to 18, 221 were under 16, and 28% of those were female. It'll be interesting to see as we get more and more numbers whether these, these statistics continue. In addition to porn, 24% had used web webcam sex, 25% sex chat, and 27% have viewed adult TV channels. There was a funny memory from that. I tried to get into uh, something on our Sky channel. My daughter had gone off to uni and uh, couldn't get in. And ended up saying, I couldn't remember what the password was. And in passing, I was mentioning to, to my daughter, Harriet, I don't know what's happened, we can't get into the town. The password number's her birthday. I said, how do you know that? She said, well, I set it up. And she'd done it years ago. And I was like, oh. Well, there's all this stuff about blocking access. This wasn't on adult channels. This is just some other Netflix thing. But it's the same system to get into it. All the stuff in the press about trying to do um, the porn blockers for kids. Yeah, I mean, this is brilliant. Don't get me wrong. I think it's really important that we minimise, we make it as hard as possible for people under 18 to access pornography. But let's face it, that hasn't stopped people under 18 smoking cigarettes or drinking alcohol, has it? We have got to have education here. And I, I, I do applaud the government pushing for age verification. But if you want to know how to get around a porn blocker, if you Google it, you'll find a very helpful 12-year-old lad who will have made a YouTube video on how to get around covenant eyes. <laughs> yeah? They are the generation that can get around this stuff. Um, yeah, so of the 16 to 18-year-olds, you can read that stat. It's pretty scary. Is it 21% of them use webcams? So this is not just porn. And is there one more bullet point? 14% of under 16-year-olds use sex chat, 17% webcam, 19% of viewed adult TV. The adult TV just kind of, it just kind of makes me smile because I'm... I'm I generally believe that parents do what they can to protect kids, generally. I'm sure most of those parents would have absolutely no idea and would be horrified that they knew how to even get to those channels. Most parents probably don't even know they're on there. Anyway, next. So how do you identify when something is an addiction? Uh, really, the, 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 the definition of addiction is something that has a negative impact on other areas of your life. If there's no harmful consequences, we don't tend to use the word addiction. We use the word habit, problem, heavy use, whatever. Um, there needs to be some significant negative impacts on your life. If you think about it, if you're a gambling addict, but you're also a multimillionaire and you can afford to lose a thousand pounds a week, is it a gambling addiction? It probably is, but you're probably not going to get help. 
anyway, but you're a happy gambling addict. But it's only really when something sign has significant negative consequences, we call it an addiction. I often um, share with people I'm a uh, reformed smoker, so I was a cigarette smoker for many, many years. And the only reason I stopped smoking cigarettes is because apparently they're bad for your health. I don't know if any of you knew that. But apparently they're really bad for your health. And I, was, I gave up many years ago when I was pregnant. It's really bad if you're pregnant. So I thought I'd better stop. If it wasn't bad for me, if they suddenly found out that there is zero impact from cigarette smoking, more people would smoke and we wouldn't call it an addiction. We might as well call it unsociable and all that kind of stuff, but we wouldn't call it an addiction. It's only because it's got harmful consequences. So does it have significant harmful consequences? And often what you're looking at in, in that um, is, is it impacting your relationships or your ability to get into a relationship? Is it impacting um, school studies, your ability to study, to revise? Is it getting in the way of friendships, relationships, spending time with friends, going out with friends? Is it impacting your self-esteem, how you feel about yourself because you're doing this? So those probably particularly with young people are the most common side effects. Does it contradict your personal values? Next. Um, another abs <laughs> absolute um, sort of giveaway on whether something's an addiction, whether you've tried to stop but failed. Um, a friend of mine's mum, when I was growing up, was, she was a real smoker as well, and she was like, oh, giving up smoking's easy. I've done it hundreds of times. <laughs> uh, but you've got to stop and stay stopped. And again, if you can't stop, then you know you've got a problem. And if the thought of having to stop and it's the classic that people say, I haven't got an alcohol problem, I don't, you know, I don't mind, yeah, it wouldn't bother me at all. Why don't you stop then? And then you sort of see them going into an absolute cold sweat. Yeah, that's kind of given the game away, isn't it? Uh, the other key one is that if you need more and more stimuli or risk in order to get the same level of arousal or excitement. So again, this, remember, dopamine is a common denominator in all addictions. What happens with dopamine, you get a surge of dopamine, once you get used to that level of dopamine. Your body gets used to it and you don't get a buzz anymore. So you need more. And then you get used to that. Um, I, I use lots of food metaphors explaining to clients um, what I quite often say is it's a bit like if you, if you put a bit of salt on your food and you think, oh, this is quite nice with a bit of salt, quite like this, and then you, you eat your food with that shake of salt on it, it's not going to taste salty anymore after a while, so you're going to need to put a teaspoon on. And then, after a while, that's not going to taste salty, so you're going to need to put a, a, a tablespoon on. And what happens is your tolerance to saltiness goes up and up and up. But what also happens is it starts numbing the pleasure response. So what happens is, going back to the salt analogy, after a while, other food just tastes bland. The kind of food you used to enjoy... You don't enjoy it anymore. It just tastes bland and boring and tasteless because you got so used to having that tablespoon of salt on everything. And the same happens with addiction. So the kind of things that you used to find enjoyable, you used to find exciting, you used to find rewarding, you don't anymore. And this isn't purely psychological. This is biological. And this is really important for young people to understand. When they're saying, you know, I'm bored, nothing else is good, I don't enjoy anything else, they're not just being moody adolescents. Some of this is biological change. And helping them to understand that this is a biological change that happens begins to reduce the shame, but it also gives them a way out. You know what? Start cutting back on your salt and you'll get your taste buds back again. Yeah, we can, there's a great thing about neural pathways, you can change them, you can reverse the process. Okay, so beating addiction. Uh, I told you about that, that's that porn addiction help. So basically three tasks, you need to face it, you need to understand it, and you need to fight it, and I'm going to go through those. So, face it. Identify the actual and potential harmful consequences. So, I already started talking about that a little bit. Um, but, you know, is this... And I think the actual and potential is important. If you carry on like this... So, maybe you're with someone talking to somebody and they're saying, you know, like porn, so what? Does it matter? And maybe it doesn't. Don't, the worst thing you can do with an addict is try and persuade them that they are. But the, an important, much more important question is, how would you know if it is a problem? 
So it doesn't get in the way of in your relationships at the moment. Do you think it might? Can you envisage? How would it be if it did? So what are the potential consequences if you continue like this? If it was to get worse, so it doesn't have an impact now, now it's only up. What if it was to go to an end? Get them to begin to think forward a bit to what, what the problem might look like, because then hopefully they'll stop before they get there. Work studies, future goals and dreams, self-esteem, I've never said all these, right? and of, of course, spiritual growth. But what are the potential consequences as well as the actual consequences? Okay, this is known as the cycle of addiction. It, it's, it's in the book, Confronting Paul. But I'm going to talk you through this, because this is a, a really useful tool for helping people with addiction. I'm going to talk you through this, and then, surprise, surprise, you're going to have some time on your own to actually begin to personalize this and think about this for some situations for yourself. So listen, because you're going to get tested effectively. So let me talk you through this. So basically, in the dormant phase, the other thing we know about addictions is that often they're a way of escaping something painful and difficult. Okay? So... Very broadly speaking, addictive behaviours or substances are a way of escaping a negative and creating a positive. Yeah, this, this is very natural. We do it all the time. We're sitting nervously in the dentist waiting room and we're going to pick up the most boring magazine on the planet, Caravan Weekly or whatever, um, <laughs> and we're going to start flicking through it because, boring though it is, it distracts us from the fact that we're just about to have root canal work. Yeah? We're trying to get rid of a negative and try and experience a positive. This is very, very basic psychology. So it's the way we live all the time. Um, but there's going to be something that you're trying to escape. Addictions are often referred to as anesthetics. They're a way of anesthetizing against something. But often, whilst you're actually in the grips of an addiction, you're not sure what it is you're anesthetizing against. So I see so many clients who don't have any problems that, yeah, that's because you're an addict. Stop being an addict, then you're going to have some really big problems because all that stuff you've been anaesthetizing against will begin to come to the fore. So there are things in the dormant phase. Then there are triggers. So triggers can be either environmental or emotional. Environmental is, I've got, I've got a smartphone, I've got an hour to kill. Why not? Um, but um, my... Also, uh, but it might also be, and so the environmental one is, I always look at porn before I go to sleep. It's just kind of become my routine. It's what I do. It's how I get to sleep at night. Yeah, some people have a cup of cocoa. I look at porn. Um, but also emotional. So what are the emotional triggers? Are you more likely to look at pornography if you're tired, if you're lonely, if you're feeling isolated, if you feel rejected, if you feel whatever, Yeah. So what are the emotional triggers are likely to, to get you to act out, which is the term? Preparation phase. Preparation phase, this is the, the, the key bit here, is what we call cognitive distortions. The layperson's term for this generally, excuse my language, but is bullshit. Okay? Cognitive distortions are the lies we tell ourselves in order to do something we know we shouldn't really do, but we're going to do it anyway, yeah? Um, I'm going to do a little bit of an experiment here. I can't see everybody, but um, can I ask you to put your hand up if you have never, ever broken the speed limit? There's a few. Right, wait, there's a part two. Just with those of you thinking, oh, I didn't think I'd be on can you put your hand down if you don't drive? <laughs> right, that's what I thought. <laughs> um, I, I assume you all think speed limits are quite a good idea, and they're there for a reason, and we shouldn't, really. Particularly if you've got a little fish on the back of your car, Jesus loves you as you're <laughs> bombing down the outside lane. <laughs> So you know you shouldn't be doing this, but what are the cognitive distortions you use? Yeah? Um, and I can, I can tell you a true story of me breaking the speed limit. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you what happened. Um, so basically, I was very fortunate. I did see the police car. 
I did. Um, so I was able to slow down before I went past him, which meant I didn't lose my license. Yeah, I was going quite fast. Um, now, my cognitive distortions are, it was a completely empty road. Yeah? The circumstance was fun, but so using you know, rationality, it was a completely empty road. It was really, really quiet, apart from one police car, clearly. It was really, really quiet road. The, the conditions, it was dry, it was safe, it was fine. Um, another cognitive distortion um, is that um, I, I was very tired and I wanted to get home. Um, I can throw a bit of a pity one in here. My father had quite recently died, and I'd been visiting my mum. I'm not making this up. I'd been visiting my mum. Yet again, she lives four hours away, four hours there, four hours back. I was going back again. I'd been up there, you know, and it was goodness knows how many times I'd done that trip. Um, so that was another reason I was speeding. And the other reason I was speeding is that I'm actually an exceptionally good driver. Not everybody is. Some people, unfortunately, don't have the skill and the talent that I have, but <laughs> I am an exceptionally good driver, which is why, for me, it's okay to break the speed limit. The other one that's great when I'm occasionally breaking the speed limit is when a car goes... Is, is, oh, the other common one is everybody speeds. Generalisation. Every, everybody speeds, therefore it's okay. Or comparison, I'm not going as fast as him. Yeah, when the racing, the Porsche goes vroom, and you go, well, I'm not going as fast as he is. I'm only going 90. Um, <laughs> but I'm not as bad as is a really, really good common cognitive distortion. The other thing that happened, and I think it was... <laughs> so the other cognitive distortion that I have now is it was good that I broke the speed limit because it's helped me speak at so many Christian conferences <laughs> and understand addiction. Anyway, um, but... I got three points on my license, I had to sit in the police car, and I, I could have lost my license, there's no doubt about it. I, I was going over 100. Um, <laughs> I thought this was a safe, non-judgmental space. Um, <laughs> and as I sat in the police car, I, was, I live right in the sticks, okay? My kids were still at school, and I was just like, oh my goodness, if I lose my license, I mean, it really, I'm the main breadwinner in the house. How am I going to get to work? How am I going to get the kids to school? I was sat in that police car going, you stupid, stupid, stupid woman. You stupid woman. You arrogant woman that you thought you could get away with it. You stupid, stupid woman. And I, and I, I drove home at 70 all the way. This, this is going back about six years now. Hands up if you think I've never broken the speed limit since. No. That's what happens with addiction. At that moment, I'd hit rock bottom, which we refer to often in addiction, and I really did think that I wouldn't speed again. But the problem is the pain wears off. That's what happens. The pain wears off. And I didn't just get in the car in a couple of weeks and go, ah, stuff it, 110. That's not the way it happens. And that's not what happens with addiction. You go from 70 to 75, on a motorway, not on a town, yeah. 70 to 75, and then you go from 75 to 80, and you're a bit more cautious. You look round, you check, and that's what happens with addiction. I will look, I'm only going to look at YouTube sites, I won't look at pornography. I'm only going to do, I'll only look for five minutes. I'll only, and you make all these bargains, and gradually, bit by bit, bit by bit, you're back to where you were again. That is what happens with addiction. So the intention, the good intention to stop is real and it's genuine. But it's those cognitive distortions that gradually build you up to the point where you end up breaking it again. Acting, oh no, no, back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, acting out, whatever that might be. You could use this cycle for any kind of addiction. I'm using it for, you know, speeding. So that was speeding. Regret, never, ever, ever going to do that again. Kind of talk through this. Reconstitution, right, that's it. Going to be sensible. Going to do, you know, not going to do it again. But go into the dormant phase. So, what, you know, so what's my, some of my dormant phase stuff for why I broke the speed limit is arrogance. There is an element of arrogance. Yeah, I can keep my eyes open, I can drive safely. There, there's an element of arrogance. There's impatience as well. Yeah? Um, there, there's a whole number of kind of psychological things that would go on underneath that means that for some reason I can't obey a speed limit. But it's, yeah, it goes deeper than that. Okay, 
So, what I'm going to invite you to do, you can change the slide now, is get into small groups and, is there any more on that page? Or is that it? Yeah, just put, put it all up. Think about that cycle and just in twos and threes, twos and fours, if you want to turn, out, turn around to someone behind you, think about something you've done that you know you shouldn't have done. If you want to be really brave, you can uh, fess up to an addiction. It could be drinking too much. It could be parking illegally, those double yellow lines that don't count for me. It could be breaking the speed limit. Sounds like plenty of you have got that as an example. Uh, eating all the donuts, skiving church, whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, we've all done it. Come on. Um, what were your triggers? What were, what were the, the kind of emotional things that were going on? Yeah, was it feeling tired? Was it feeling angry? Was it feeling like, you know, what is it? I mean, overeating, such a class, being impatient. What were the triggers? What are your cognitive distortions? What do you tell yourself for why it's okay on this occasion? Why you deserve to, or whatever it might be? What are the potential consequences? And maybe there's stuff that you learned through childhood adolescence that makes you more likely than someone else to do this. That would be the stuff in the dormant phase. Good. How much time have I got on that clock? I'm going to give you about eight minutes. Well, nine minutes and counting. So I'm going to stop at 50 to do that. Okay? Just have a little think, have a little chat about it. Okay? Okay. I ask you to end your conversations. Was that helpful to get you kind of thinking about it? Yeah. Unfortunately, we all do things we know we shouldn't, and often we do them repeatedly. That was kind of the point of that. And just looking, I, I hope that's helped you to think about how you can use that. You could use that cycle helpfully with somebody to kind of break down. Because once you can understand that cycle, you can then um, begin to break it. And really, the, the basic principle of psychotherapy is that actually once you can make something conscious, ah, I do this because of this, you then have more choice to intervene and do something differently. If you don't know why you do it, then it's much harder. Okay, so what are you going to do about it? Fight it. Next one. So, some techniques that can be really helpful. Think about what would my life be like without it? Create a vision. What would I like better? What would be better than this? Um, there's a metaphor that I really like, which is really helpful. They say that if you want to get a bone off of a dog, what you don't do is grab the bone and pull, because they just dig their teeth in even more. One way to get a bone off of a dog, apparently, is to kick them really, really sharply up the arse, apparently. Um, but... Not a popular one on the RSPCA. Um, but as my car example um, shows, pain is not, pain wears off. It's not a good way of stopping. The best way to get a bone off of a dog is to give them something else. That is how you get a bone off of a dog. And I do think we are in a unique position as Christians to have that vision of something so much better. That is what we can offer as a something else. Um, help them to think of healthy coping strategies. We all get stressed. We all get tired. We all feel rejected. We all can struggle with low self-esteem. What can you do instead? When you've got that trigger and you're wanting to flick your phone, you're wanting to do something, what could you do differently? What other strategies might you have that you could do? Um, porn protection is an obvious one. One of the challenges, particularly for young people, is... If they, is having um, an, an accountability partner, someone who can put the password in. Yeah, it's a, such a simple thing. The way you, you load porn protection up is that you need to put a password on. If you know the password, then it's completely pointless. So, you know, offer to be that person. You know, bring it in, I'll help you download it, I'll put the password in for you. Um, the other thing that can be helpful, very simple exercise, what kinds of things are dangerous towards your recovery? Are there people that actually you spend time with that may make it harder. So if you think about alcohol, yeah, there's going to be drinking buddies. There's those people who drink a lot that you probably should avoid. Are there places? I often, you know, those that um, often uh, look at porn in their bedrooms, it's a real simple technique. Rearrange your room. Make it a different space. 
put up different pictures, turn your bed around, make it a different space, go to bed at a different time. Yeah, really ch just change it. Are there places that are dangerous, people that are dangerous, particular situations? Look at the last few times when you um, acted out, when you looked at porn, when you didn't want to. What are those dangerous situations? How might you avoid those? Failing to plan is planning to fail. Real cliche, but it is true in addiction. And what are the things that are supportive of? And it's not rocket science, this. You do more of the stuff that's supportive of spending time in healthy places with healthy people and less time in the dangerous ones. Run. Run is an acrostic. Remove yourself immediately. If you have got your phone and you are tempted, you put your phone down and you get out. This is, this is the, short, the two shortest sentences in the Bible. He ran. Joseph from Potiphar's wife. He ran. He didn't stand there looking at her, looking all gorgeous or whatever, thinking, hmm, now I'm wondering if I really should do this. He ran. So remove yourself immediately. Undistort your thinking. Yeah, the, yeah, but everybody does it, but I'll only be 10 minutes, but it's not as bad as all of those cognitive distortions. Stop it. It's rubbish. You are lying to yourself. And never forget what you have to lose. Think about the higher price. Think about what it is that you really want. Accountability. If you can be an accountability partner, if you can set up an accountability group, um, if you can do something just where people can say, how are you doing this week? How's it going? And the, the, something they say in 12 Step A Lot, which I think is really important, is progress, not perfection. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty against some of the websites that count off days. You've got to do 90 days. Oh, you got to 85. Hard luck, day one. It is soul destroying. If you've done better than last week, better than last month, congratulations. Well done. The key drivers of addiction are secrecy and shame. And I think this is something where, you know, churches and youth workers particularly can be so active in breaking through the secrecy and the shame. And first and foremost, it is just by talking about it, just making this on the agenda. Porn is part of our culture. Whether we like it or not, it's here. I don't think it's going to go away. Porn is part of our culture. We need to start talking about it and getting comfortable talking about it. And that in itself will begin to reduce the shame. It's okay to talk about it. It's fine. I'm cool with that. How anyone can help, compassion. I hope that some of the experience that you've done with that cycle of addiction has helped you realize that actually, I, I believe we're all addicts. Yeah, to a lesser or greater extent, we are all somewhere on that continuum addicted to something. I wish I was addicted to Bible reading. <laughs> but anyway, but we are all on there somewhere. Compassion, we all have our habits. Communication, talking about it and counsel, and I've gone one minute over. Sorry, I think that was the last slide. Thank you. <laughs>